Good morning. My name is Alicia McDonough from the USC Keck School of Medicine, and I moderated a session today at the council meeting entitled SGLT2 Inhibitors, the Kidney and Beyond. And our first speaker was Volker Vallon from UC San Diego. And um, I'd like to have him go over some of the key points that he brought up in his wonderful, um, in his, in his wonderful lecture about basic mechanisms. So Volker, one of your themes was that SGLT2 inhibitors preserve the integrity of the tubule system. And that was one of the ways that this inhibitor could aid in the treatment of many kidney diseases. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, sure. I think the, the, the research over the last 20, 30 years was very much glomerular focused. And there was little attention paid to the tubules, actually. But on the other hand, we know that the, 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 the glomeruli filtering a lot of salt. Uh, it's about 180 liters per day of fluid and a lot of salt. And um, if you would just lose 10% of that salt, we would be kind of volume depleted very rapidly. So there has to be a coordination between the tubular system to reabsorb that salt and the glomeruli. And so this kind of illustrates the, really the importance of the integrity of the tubular system. It doesn't make sense that the kidney maintains GFR if the tubular system is not prepared for it. And therefore, it's really important to maintain the integrity of the proximal tubule, uh, of the tubule in general. And um, this glucose transport that we are talking about is expressed in this very early segment of the proximal tubule that actually reabsorbs most of the filtered salt and fluid. So this is a heavy working segment. Um, and therefore, um, if you now block this glucose transporter, um, you're not only giving the uptake of glucose, but um, as we learn more and more, this transporter is functionally coupled to all kinds of transporters in the brush part of the proximal tubule, whether that's a sodium proton exchanger or a urate transporter, they all are functionally coupled. And so if we now tickle kind of uh, just that glucose transporter, the other transporters are also responding with reduced transport. So if we now block the glucose uptake in that proximal tubule, we're also inhibiting um, urate uptake, um, 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 sodium uptake, uh, bicarbonate uptake. But we also learned in the proteomic studies that we uh, have recently done, many more transporters are functionally interacting or physically interacting actually with the SGD2. So we have done some interactomic analysis um, in the human kidney and the mouse kidney, which asks which transporters are physically interacting with SGD2. Mm -hmm. And we actually, the same transporters came up, or the same proteins came up for both, which I think is really encouraging. Um, and, and, and one message was that many of those so-called scaffolding proteins, which um, get transporters in and out of the membrane, were kind of um, interacting with SGD2. Mm -hmm. And these are the transporters that now, these scaffolding proteins that, that now link SGD2 to urate 1, to energy 3 and kind of explain why if you tickle one, the other one is kind of co-responding. Mm -hmm. And of course the question is why should the kidney be set up in this way? And um, our explanation is that the GFR that I mentioned before is this huge number um, and, and when the, we have during the day significant physiological variations in GFR. So if we, if we ate a big steak, um, our GFR goes up by 20%. So we are filtering up more glucose, sodium, urate, bicarbonate, everything. And so under these conditions it makes sense that those transporters are coordinated because then they go up and down in the brush board in a coordinated way and take care of this extra load. Um, and so as a consequence we think that in response to an to inhibitor we're really not just affecting glucose transport but there's really a very basic remodeling of that early proximal mm -hmm. tubule uh, which then for some reason has a very protective effect of the kidney overall. And again, I think that um, the early proximal tubule where the transport is expressed may have a very decisive role for overall kidney health. You know, um, the proximal tubule consumes less oxygen because of the paracellular transporters than the distal nephron. So it's already more efficient, but it's also more susceptible to injury. So it seems like by further lowering the work that the proximal tubule does, you can have a protective effect. 
in the proximal tube. Yes, the yes. So that's what that's what we think is happening in response to the 2 inhibitor. We're reducing the workload to this early proximal tubular segment. But of course, if you inhibit the transport in this early proximal tubular segment, you're shifting that transport downstream. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's then more glucose and salt and amino acids mm -hmm. and everything reabsorption in the S3 segment and downstream. Mm -hmm. And so you can wonder, oh, why should that be good for the kidney or why should it matter for the kidney, whether you have the reabsorption in the S1 segment or further downstream. And um, this may not matter in a healthy kidney, but it may help ha uh, play a role in a diseased kidney. Mm -hmm. um, that if we now have a little bit better distribution of transport along the nephron, mm -hmm. that this could be something beneficial, again, for the integrity of mm -hmm. those tubular cells. And then if the integrity of the tubular cells is preserved, the GFR can be kind of preserved in the long term. So that's, that, that's a concept. But of course, we have to better understand what is happening if we are shifting transport to those distal segments, uh, and some of them distal segments are now getting uh, into the deep cortex, into the outer medulla. And we know that the outer medulla is a very vulnerable structure, so do we have to be concerned that um, we into some hypoxia in those segments which then kind of could be bad for the kidney health overall? Um, that is a concern. On the other hand, we also know that in these sites of the kidney, in the deep cortex, outer medulla, this is where, for some reason, um, there are specific fibroblast-like cells that yeah. sense um, oxygen. And this is the site where the body makes most of its erythropoietin. Right. And erythropoietin is important for the production of red blood cells. And red blood cells transport oxygen, right? right? And so we came up with the hypothesis that an SGL2 inhibitor, by shifting transport into the outer medulla, by keeping those segments more busy, using more oxygen, that now these, 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 these um, hypoxia sending cells sense hypoxia. Mm -hmm. Even though there is no systemic hypoxia, but it's just mm -hmm. a trick of the drug right. by shifting the transport from the cortex to the outer medulla. And now the entire body benefits from a small right. increase of an increased oxygen transport capacity. Do you think this could account for some of the positive effect of SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Absolutely. So what is really interesting is people have done some so-called mediation analysis um, to get close about what are the quantitatively important mechanisms. And so in a mediation analysis you ask what phenotype in response to the drug observed in the clinical trial is associated with improved kidney outcome or heart failure outcome. And the dominant factor that came out was the increased in metabolism. Yeah, isn't that something? Isn't that something, yeah. right? And so, I mean, could you have predicted this well, before? Well, all the organs. Yes, yeah. yes. So could we have predicted that before? Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. So my point is that the kidney is a very complex three-dimensional structure with more than 40 different cells. In order to get a better understanding of what's, what a drug is doing, um, we have to have a very integrative understanding of mm -hmm. what the different cells are doing, what's happening if you manipulate one cell, what's happening downstream. And so I think the big message is that an SG2 inhibitor, the primary target is in, in the early proximal tumor, but the whole kidney is responding to it. And we have to better understand what this is doing. So I see those SG2 inhibitor also as a chance to come up with new drug targets. And we kind of did this recently. We kind of uh, were thinking about what is it that is so unique about an SGLT2 inhibitor or about SGLT2. Um, and so SGLT2 is a sodium carbon transporter. Um, it's expressed only in the early proximal tubule. Um, uh, if you reabsorb too much of the substrate, that's bad. That's the glucose. It has some link to GFR. Um, if you inhibit the transport, you're shifting more transport into the outer medulla. And if you block the transporter, you induce a fasting-like systemic response because you're losing mm -hmm. the glucose in the brain. Yeah. And so we're thinking, is there another transporter uh, that may do the same thing? And we came up with a sodium-coupled amino acid transporter, SLC6A19, only expressed in the early proximal tubule. It's coupled to GFR because we know amino acids increase mm -hmm. the GFR. If we inhibit the transporter, more amino acids have to be reabsorbed downstream. We actually see some stress signals in the knockout mouse in the outer medulla similar mm -hmm. to an SG2 yeah. inhibitor. And um, the drugs also, or, or inhibiting that transporter also induces a fasting like response because you're now losing mm -hmm. amino acids to the urine. And the transporter is also expressed in the intestine. Mm 
So you're also inhibiting the uptake of uh -huh. amino acids there. So there are a lot of similarities. And um, um, we found that this transporter is actually also interacting with SGLT2. Mm -hmm. It's a co-expressed at the same site. Uh -huh. And we, we, we tested now a knockout for that, uh, for that transporter in a kidney injury model that has human relevance and find protective effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so try, yeah. try to learn from what SGLT2 is to kind of then take the next step to come up with new targets. It seems to work to some extent. Well, Volker, the future is very interesting and lots of possibilities coming forward. I'd like to just make one last comment, which at least in rodent models, we know that there's a female advantage to cardiovascular disease, lower blood pressure, lower disease, at least before menopause. And what is the female advantage? A lot of work, again, points to the proximal tubule, that females have less proximal tubule transport, more transport needs to be done in the outer medulla and further along, and it gives them an advantage. So, so I think that's a really interesting thought, and, and, and I was also thinking about that. So to some respect, um, as a two inhibitor would kind of turn a male kidney into a female kidney to some extent yeah. with regard to shifting uh -huh. more transport from the proximal tubule um, mm -hmm. to the distal tubule. But of course there's more to that, right? right. Because, oh, yeah, because, because, because also this glucotoxicity in the early proximal tubule is really something very detrimental mm -hmm. for those cells then, especially um, also in the diabetic setting. Mm -hmm. We think this, re this enhanced glucose uptake in the S1 segment really changes the phenotype of those cells. Mm -hmm. They develop a, a process that is called senescence. Mm -hmm. So those proximal tubal cells, in response to hyperglycemia for one or two weeks, they forgot that they are proximal tubal cells. Oh, goodness. Isn't that hard to imagine? Yeah. And then there are very strange responses, mm -hmm. uh, and I was mentioning before the salt paradox. Yeah. But, but that phenotype is also linked to pro-inflammatory processes, mm -hmm. to um, um, pro-secretory processes, and we think to that pathway early on the kidney is set for, for failure in the long term. And that of course would specifically be inhibited now by an apical glucose uptake inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well thank you very much. It was a wonderful symposium and a very nice discussion. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you very much Alicia.